our guest today is Seb Boyer. Seb is founding CEO of FarmWise. Following his true passion for sustainability issues, Seb co-founded FarmWise in 2016 with a mission to help farmers transition to more sustainable farming practices and deal with new regulatory and societal changes. Before co-founding FarmWise, Seb worked as a mathematician for IBM Research and a data scientist for Facebook. He holds a master's in electrical engineering and computer sciences from MIT, where he studied machine learning. Seb was one of the winners of the MIT Tech Review's 35 Innovators Under 35 Europe in 2018 and named to the 2019 Forbes 30 Under 30. Seb, so great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to, uh, to this. Same here. Now, before diving into today's conversation, I'd like to thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Weights and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages, from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including AI, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covarian, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. Weights and Biases is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, model and data set versioning, and model management. They are used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, many, if not all of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covariant are big users of Weights and Biases. Seb, so great to have you here. Um, in this podcast, of course, we talk a lot about AI. And if I look at recent episodes, it's been very often in the digital world where a lot is happening in AI, but just as much in the physical world, things are happening. And what, what's more physical than, you know, our food supply chain and making sure we actually stay physically fit, eat good foods and so forth. Um, before we dive into the AI itself, um, I think it might be good for us to chat a little bit about the history of tag in farming overall. Um, so when you think about farming from what it used to be when, you know, farming started thousands of years ago, where did things really started to change? Yeah, um, and that's something that um, I think is really interesting. And I spent uh, quite a bit of time studying this. Um, I think really like the beginning of the 20th century is when technology or oh, this new wave of technology really hit the, the farm. Um, and I, I can go over a couple of them. Like the first one really was um, the Habibosch process, the, that process that made it possible to produce fertilizer um, out of essentially thin air. Um, and that really unlocked a new um, degree of productivity and, and yield ratios um, on, on the farm. That really happened at the, like, the first 20 years of the, of the 20th century. And then you have different revolution. You have the tractor revolution from 1900 all the way to 1950, 1960, where we went from zero farm having tractors to pretty much every farm having tractors. And that obviously replaced uh, horses um, and that added like a whole new level of productivity. Then in the 60s and 70s, we had chemistry, um, the invention of the first kind of very powerful um, chemicals. And then alongside that, a little bit later, but kind of a alongside that, we had um, GMOs, which also um, essentially created uh, crops that were much more resilient to a lot of different factors, which increased yields um, drastically as well. And Slightly after that, in the in the 1990s and uh, the 2000, we had we we had GPSs, and that again uh, helped farmers kind of yet reach a new level of productivity. Um, I think that today and since maybe like 10 years ago and, and onward for the next couple of decades, we're in the middle of a new wave of um, technology um, hitting the farm, 
with AI in robotics. And some of the numbers that I find interesting is that when you look at the, um, the, the, some of the numbers that capture the productivity on the farm in, in 1900, and you look at the same numbers in, in, in 2020, uh, which is kind of the most recent data um, I could find, it's, it's really drastic. Like you, one number, I think one of the uh, most interesting one is just the, num the, the sheer number of people that are required to feed um, society. In, in 1900, about 40% of population was involved with uh, food production, 40%. So that's almost like one in, one in two. Um, today, it's around 2%. And the, um, the, the number of acres hasn't changed. Like we, the US farms about the same number of acres than it did in, in 1900. Um, so that's a first measure of pr productivity gain. Another one is just the, the yield per, per acre. Um, corn, for instance, has seen like a five to six X increase in um, the, the, just the, the weight of produce that comes out of each acre um, between 1900 again in 2020. So I think these are kind of a couple of numbers that to me are striking because um, they show us how much technology and these different technology waves have impacted productivity and therefore impacted um, just efficiency uh, on on the farm. And I think we're not done yet. And I think AI and robotics, as we're going to talk about, um, are going to be are going to have as much of an impact on on farm productivity as these other revolutions uh, had in the past. So I'm pretty excited about this. It sounds really, I mean, mind boggling. The productivity increases. Um, I want to double click on a few things you said there. You said the Haber Bosch. Um, process good generate fertilizer out of thin air that sounds pretty magical what exactly is that process and what kind of thin air are is being used for this yeah so um especially be before harbor bosch um we 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 relied on um, am ammonia that was found on um on on, on carries in like mostly in south america like we will ship ammonia throughout the world europe u.s from South America mostly and, and a couple of other places, there, there was like a huge trade of that product. Um, and in about the 1900s, we essentially run out. Uh, and it's an amazing story. By the way, I highly recommend the book that speaks about this from, um, it's from Thomas Hager that's called The Alchemy of Air. Uh, I think it's an amazing book. And it essentially explains how we run out of that um, very essential product that all, like every farmer in the world relied on. Um, just the world just ran out of it. And so there was this huge science race to figure out a way to create it because everyone now relied on it, kind of similar to almost like fossil fuel today. We all rely on it. We're running out of it. We need to find uh, alternatives. Very similar story. And these two scientists from, from Germany, Haber and Bosch, spent, I don't exactly remember, 15, 20 years um, researching ways to do that. Obviously, they were not alone, but they, they kind of won that race. Uh, and, that, um, and, and so they figure out this heavy chemical process that essentially is capable of transforming the nitrogen from the air into the ammonia. So like, like essentially, um, like, doing chemistry on the nitrogen from the air to turn it into ammonia that plants can, uh, can take. And that's the process that today uh, feed, essentially feeds the world. Um, now, as we're going to see, like this has a whole new um, side to it because this process is now uh, responsible for almost 2% of CO2 emissions globally. So if you look at all CO2 emissions, um, from rockets to cars to industrial processes, almost 2% of all of these emissions are due to that process and essentially are due to the need for society to produce fertilizer. Uh, so there are huge opportunities to now kind of do better, but that process like 100 years ago unlocked um, a new, um, new level of, of productivity and, and yield. It's interesting you allude to some of the side effects here in that massive productivity increase, but some side effects that we might want to mitigate or avoid altogether. 
And that also came to mind when you mentioned the, the chemicals that improve the agricultural uh, yield and productivity. Um, because when you go shopping now, um, you go to a grocery store here in, in California, it'll often say organic food. And organic food means that the chemicals haven't been applied, sprayed onto the crops. Um, or even often in people at the, the food will advertise non-GMO um, to specifically say we're not using the GMO <laughs> um, techniques to, to improve yield. Um, so, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I mean, specifically GMO, non-GMO, people debate whether it matters or not. Um, the chemicals, it seems, is less up for debate, and it seems pretty clear people think it's better to, to avoid. But I'm curious about your take. Yeah, so I think for, for most of these um, technology revolutions, they came with side effects. Like the first order is awesome. The first order in like being able to apply fertilizer really cheaply, it's amazing. It's kind of magical. Same for tractors. Same for chemicals, like when we, um, when the, the uh, chemical industry came up with these powerful chemicals that were able to prevent diseases, prevent insects from, from um, taking out yield and prevent uh, weeds from, from growing on fields, that essentially appeared to be pretty magical uh, in, invention. Now, a couple of decades later, so that, that was like super cool invention and, and we obviously um, derived a lot of advantages from these inventions. A couple of decades later, now we're starting to kind of feel the side effects. Um, so I mentioned the side effect of Harbor Bosch. You're right to say that chemicals um, have a ton of side effects. We now know that they're very harmful for the health of farmers to start with. Uh, they're most likely, a lot of them are not good at all for the health of consumers. Uh, you have residues on the plant and so you have re residues on on the food that you eat, and that has side effects essentially correlated with uh, with cancers. Um, and then you have impact of these same chemicals on the biodiversity in and around farms. Really used from these chemicals um, kill very essential wildlife, like bees, for instance. So now we're starting to really feel or yeah feel and become conscious of the side effects. With GMOs, I think that one is, is still up for debate. I don't think it, my current understanding is that we just don't have enough data to conclude. Um, there is for now not conclusive, um, data to say that they're harmful, um, or that they're safe. Um, so kind of this one, I think is up for debate. I, I don't want to necessarily like, um, uh, guess here, but for these other things, we do have very measurable side effects that we now need to, to tackle. So new challenge ahead, in some sense, opportunity to, to take things to the next level. And I think it's in that context that you started your company. Absolutely. As you say, um, new challenges bring new um, new opportunities. And so my co-founder and I started FarmWise um, starting from this idea that uh, chemicals have way more side effects than what um, we want to tolerate as a society. I mentioned all, all of them uh, um, just a, a minute ago. And so we wanted to tackle that particular issue first um, and see if we could do better. Um, and as we started, we um, got quickly convinced that AI and robotics was actually a, a potential great solution to help farmers uh, do better uh, with, with chemicals. So that's why we started FarmWise, you're right. There's a lot of revolutions in farming happening in parallel. Um, and I guess we can cover them in different orders, but how about we dive in with AI robotics, but other things are on my mind, like indoor farming, um, vertical farming, all kinds of things that are seeing new, new things happen. But let's start with AI and robotics closest to my heart. Why do you think AI and robotics are so important for the future of farming? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Nate. So essentially, when you look at the big challenges of agriculture today, um, you need, um, so we need to decrease reliance on, on chemicals. Essentially what that means is that we need to be, as a society, like farmers first and foremost, need to become much more precise. They need to be able to grow as much or more food with drastically um, less resources, whether they're chemicals, water, 
uh, hopefully land at some point. So we need to become more precise. And so society need to help farmers um, increase precision. And I think that's typically something that AI is very good at. And AI combined with robotics can be very good at. Um, we can essentially, with new technology, capture more information, more detailed granular information, and use that information to have actions, to, to take actions that are much more specific. So at FarmWise, like the, the entire, um, like the, the global view that we have is that we're gonna move from a world where farmers essentially do the same thing across the field because they can't really do anything else. So they use a simple machine, for instance, they set that machine at the beginning of the field and they cover the entire field. That's today. We think we're gonna move from that world to a world where using AI and robotics, the same farmer using a similar machine can now differentiate what he or she decides to do on a plan by plan basis. And by differentiating what you do on a plan by plan basis, you can drastically increase efficiency. So by efficiency, I mean, you can use less chemicals to achieve the same outcome, the same result. You can use um, less labor, like it, it doesn't have to be much more um, time consuming to do that task. So you can essentially drastically reduce uh, inputs with inputs defined in a really broad sense, whether it's labor, water, chemicals, land, and achieve the same outcome. I think that's really is the promise of, um, of AI and robotics. And that's what we're super excited about at FarmWise and why we, we started FarmWise in the first place to unlock that potential. Now, Seb, a term I've heard in that context, and, and you tell me if it's relevant or not, is polyculture. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, it's kind of related. Now, it's not exactly what I'm talking about. There, this comes up a lot, like either uh, per, uh, permaculture or polyculture. Uh, these are kind of potential ideas for how we can, or farmers can can do better, can can. Um, can produce same food with drastically less inputs. And that comes from the fact that it's been shown that if you uh, have different culture on the same field, then you need essentially less chemicals to achieve the same, uh, the same outcome. What people often overlook is that this, com this comes as a, um, with a big cost, which is the cost of being way more labor intensive. If I tell you that now your field that used to be only salads has now one salad, one tomato uh, plant, one, one broccoli plant, it's going to be much more challenging to, to handle. So why I think permaculture and these types of um, ideas are in very interesting and they're uh, legitimate ideas to put forward, I don't think that this is where this society wants to go. I don't think society wants to go um, to, toward a system that requires much more human intervention, much more labor to, to grow the food. So I think we can strike a good balance by using AI and robotics to achieve a little bit of that precision that we want without uh, jeopardizing the entire economy, like without relying on 10x more people coming back to the field to work the land. Now, I do want to touch a little bit on indoor farming, if you allow me. Because, um, because that's another potential idea. And that's like, if you, the way I see it is you have like permaculture or polyculture, kind of going back to small farms with a lot of human intervention. You have making outdoor farms just more efficient using AI and robotics. And then you have this other idea of indoor farming. Um, you may or may not have followed the news on that, but over the past like 12 to 18 months, um, we've seen kind of a, a great reckoning away from uh, from indoor farming with a lot of bank like unfortunately bankruptcies happening in that space because today the economics just don't work for most of them um, and that's essentially because they compete with outdoor farms that can leverage uh, essentially free sun and free water from sunlight and rain and that's a and, and then like much cheaper land because they don't need to build uh, actual buildings. So it's a very tough competition for indoor farms. So I think that indoor farms have a place or have a role to play in the future 
with like within very specific niche. Um, typically, if you want fresh raspberries in the center of New York City in December, you may want to rely on on, on needle farming. Like that probably is more cost efficient than than like doing some. I mean, than having to ship them uh, by plane from the other side of the world. So there are like a few things like this. Same for the Middle East, for instance. Um, that's pro probably a good place for indoor farms to grow. Now, I think for most of us and for most of what we eat on a daily basis, my bet is on outdoor farms. My bet is on making outdoor farmers and outdoor farms more and more efficient through technology as opposed to um, shifting everything to, to indoor. But that's a personal opinion, definitely up to debate, for debate. But recently we've seen... Um, a lot of, again, a lot of indoor companies are not doing so well because of the uh, ec um, economics. Right. And some of the indoor farms would have vertical farming, so they'd have an even smaller footprint, but I guess need even more water, uh, as I understand it, to, to run it. Correct. I think like you have outdoor farms, like indoor, like greenhouses, and then even further than that, you have uh, vertical farming, which requires even more lands, more energy. Um, so I think yeah, the closer you get to um, outdoor farm, I think the wider the range of, uh, like the wider the market opportunity is going to be. So I think we, we will most likely see a balance between greenhouses and outdoor farms. But I think vertical farming is going to be a tough sell for, for most of the market. Now, I want to push back on one little thing here. When you talked about the permaculture, polyculture, a tomato, followed by, tomato plant followed by a lettuce, followed by a broccoli. And you said it would induce a lot more labor, hence it's not so practical. But it seems like maybe with enough advances in AI and robotics, and it might take a while, maybe it wouldn't, that wouldn't be a problem anymore. And then it could become part of the future, but we just need a lot more innovation on that front first. I Thank you for saying this, and I and I love that you mentioned that because this this has been like a, a dream a dream of mine for for quite some time. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's almost the end goal of outdoor farm innovation. Um, the more advanced we can get with robotics and AI, the more things the, the more we can decorrelate uh, polyculture and these types of um, things that are today very labor intensive with um, with actual like need to have humans, like more and more humans on, on the field. So you're absolutely right. Um, I think there's still quite a way to go. And I think that one of the things that people, that I typically disagree with, with um, people that are talking about permaculture um, is that like essentially a lot of that is correlated with like going back to almost like technology less or like farms with very little technology. Um, I, I disagree. And I think the way we achieve that optimal efficiency is on, on the contrary, by using a lot of technology to be able to get the most out of um, each acre without, um, without having major impact on the environment around it. Well, it'll be interesting to see when that, that'll become possible. But in the meantime, let, let's talk about what's possible today and near term. What are some examples of AI and robotics being used in outdoor farming today and what's on the horizon from here? There are a couple of things. Like first, the like information gathering capabilities have been enhanced by our ability to process um, a lot of data at very low cost. So that unlocks some power from, uh, from satellite imagery um, a little bit in some use cases from drones. Now, this is a little bit harder because data is more expensive. Um, but AI has started to be used with these tools in, in combination with these tools to process data at scale uh, cost effectively. And that helps farmers. On the field, and that's where um, I think things become even more in interesting, the AI is concretely starting to be used in kind of two ways. One, um, you have companies are building self-driving capabilities, essentially tools 
to make the farmer that's typically is like sitting in a in a tractor cab and, and kind of doing various things to make him to make him more productive. And the way they do that is typically having a bunch of sensors and and, and being able to precisely drive uh, the tool, or the tractor, but the, this is really the, the main tool that, that farmers are using to, to drive that tool very precisely and and almost autonomously so that the farmer inside that, that tractor can focus on more value add uh, tasks. So that's kind of the first application. Another ap- application that this is where my company plays um, is in the uh, precision tasks. So the ability for ag equipment to, again, precisely target specific areas of the field or even specific plants, as opposed to doing the same thing throughout throughout the field. Um, and this is where farm oil plays. And this is where, personally, I see um, the, the most opportunities, because I think there is almost no limit to how much more precise you can get if you have good data, good data processing, and then good systems to leverage that data to take more precise actions. Now, Seb, for somebody like me who has actually never worked on a farm and not really closely observed what's going on there, can you maybe take a quick step back? And when a tractor drives through the field, what is the job of that tractor or whatever devices are attached to that tractor? Yeah. um, So first of all, tractors, as their name um, uh, uh, indicates, they're here to tract. So typically, tractors actually don't do anything. What tractors do is that they tract, they carry implements, um, and these implements are the ones that are actually doing something. So first and foremost, like, tractors in and of themselves, they don't do anything, but they carry stuff that do things. What are the things that need to be done? Uh, essentially, if you look at the cycle between um, seeding and harvesting, so first you have these two things, seeding, harvesting, in the middle, you have a couple of different tasks that need to happen. Obviously, that varies depending on crop types, geographies, seasons. But by and large, you um, need to water, need to water the field. That's typically not done by tractors. That's typically done by fixed infrastructure. So things that don't look like tractors, like actual rotating gears or um, pipes that are buried in the ground, things like this. You have all of the um, treatment, the, the chemical treatment. So fungicides for diseases, like to control diseases, insecticides, herbicides. These are typically applied by um, sprayers. So essentially you have um, a very wide, like 100 feet wide bar with dozens of nozzles that are applying specific chemicals, whether fungicide, insecticide, uh, herbicides, to prevent diseases, to prevent insects from from coming to the field, or to prevent weeds uh, from from growing. So that's one task. Then you have um, fertilizing. So fertilizing can be done in different ways, either through the water, so through that fixed infrastructure that I talked about, or through tractors with again like um, some some special gears, sprayers that are applying uh, fertilizer directly on top of the crops. And these tasks typically happen more than once. So you can imagine that essentially on a typical acre of uh, farmlands, there is something happening almost every day um, or at least three to five times um, a week. So the fields are busy. Like they don't stay idle for like three or four months before harvest. Um, Farmers do a lot on them using tractors and implements. I hope that helps. That helped a lot. Thank thank you. (laughs) Now, with that context in mind, how is FarmWise changing that process? We essentially build a um, new type of implements. So the things that are um, carried by tractors. And the, the way our implements are new is that they come um, f- f- from the get-go with, with cameras and computers um, that are capable of taking pictures of plants analyzing these pictures in order to decide on specific actions to take on each of these plants. So for instance, our first product is a mechanical reading implement. So what that product does is it again takes images of plants, um, it detects each 
individual plant and classify them into species. So let's say like this is a broccoli um, or this is a weed, for instance. It locates these plants in the, the 3D space as precisely as we can. Um, so we have the species, we have the location in the 3D space. And then we use that information to move tiny blades about the size of, the size of a, a finger. Um, we have about um, like 30 of them on each uh, of our machines. And these tiny blades are going to come to like one inch deep into the ground to precisely cut out the weeds uh, in the field. And the trick here is that you don't want to hurt the crop. You have a field, you have crops that you want to harvest at some point, and you have weeds that you don't want, and they are actually competing with your crop for water, for sunlight, for nutrients, so you want to get rid of them. So what our machine does is essentially getting rid of these weeds, uh, but the way we do it does not use any, like not a single drop of, of chemical product. So we use essentially AI and robotics instead of chemistry to remove weeds. So it's kind of a, the, the AI herbicide, if you will. Now, this is very interesting on many fronts. First of all, one call out is that I think I've heard uh, something similar from a startup called Blue River acquired by John Deere, but not exactly the same. I think they would do precision spraying, but you're saying you can even let go of any kind of spraying. You can not use any chemicals can directly mechanically remove the weeds. Is that right? Absolutely right. So Blue River is a uh, great company that we know very well. And you're right, like they came up with a way to spray more precisely on plants on, for specific use cases in, in salads, you know, lettuce specifically. Our system um, essentially used me mechanical blades instead of, instead of chemistry, uh, but requires the same or even greater level of precision to be able to move these blades uh, in, in the ground. Now, after you cut the weed, do you need to pick it up or can you just leave it there? Great question. Um, actually, you, it's fine to just leave it there be because um, the reason for that is typically when farmers do these um, processes, they try to go early when the weeds are pretty small. Yeah. Because once they're too big, essentially damage is already done. Like they already took all of the nutrients and, and water that you did not want them to take in the first place. So you go there when they're tiny. And the good thing when they're tiny is that it doesn't take much to kill them. So essentially disturbing their roots enough by cutting them, kind of leaving them on top of the soil is enough to, to kill them. And what happens is that they're going to dry out under the sun in a matter of a few minutes. So that makes our job easier because we can essentially go out there, disturb them enough, um, not pick them up, and they will still die. I'm curious about, the com it must be a computer vision system that's ultimately helping the machine target the weeds. Um, can you say a bit about what kind of data do you use to train the system? What's under the hood? What's being trained? Uh, what kind of level of precision are you able to achieve? Yeah, um, so from the start, like we designed our, our uh, computer vision system to be deep learning based end to end. So we had that kind of data uh, angle very early on. We rely on our own data. So when we started, and it's still mostly the case today, uh, but when we started seven years ago, obviously you could not um, search on Google any uh, like big, large data set of plants on farms. So we had to build that that is set ourselves. So the way we we've done it is through different generations of, of robots of machines on the field. We stole we we captured and stole every single um, plant that we've seen. Um, today that amounts to we're like getting close to about a billion plants in our database. So we have about a billion individual image uh, images of plants that we've gathered uh, through the years. So that's the data, that's the raw data that we um, rely on to build our system. Uh, from there, like we use um, essentially labeling techniques to go from, uh, f from the raw images to labels. And then we train model to be able to do that differentiation that I was talking about. 
being able to label species and then um, kind of estimate the geometry of each plant through deep learning uh, methods. So that's what um, that's how the system works, or a part of the system, because that's only part of that's a piece of the equation. But then you have systems around it, both before that processing to capture very high, uh, very highly accurate images and after the processing to be able to do something with, with the, the pr predictions. Going one level deeper even, uh, I've got a quick question here. Um, I can imagine two ways of building this neural network in terms of the outputs. Uh, one could be weed or not weed, just a binary classification. Another way could be an actual classification into each of the, into each of the individual plant species, which would be many more possibilities on the output, but probably also required a network to think much deeper and maybe perform better as a consequence. Yes, that's a, that's a great point. And actually that shifted over the years. Um, so when we started, like we started with um, essentially building models that were s specific to e uh, each plant s species. So we will go on a broccoli field to, to take that example again, and essentially train the model to be able to do a simple broccoli, not broccoli type of prediction. Um, so that was like level one. Now we do much more complex things and which actually improves the overall accuracy by having a larger model that is able to leverage much more data because we don't always, we don't only work on broccoli. Like we work on about 12 different um, plant species. So we have data set on romaine, the data set on celery, uh, on carrots, on tomatoes, like we have um, dozens of millions of images for each of these plant species. So the ability for one model to leverage all of that knowledge, we actually were able to make it work so that it improves the overall accuracy even on specific tasks. So now we train kind of more um, centralized, larger models that are achieving higher accuracy but we started out by building like simpler, smaller models. It's very interesting to hear because we're at Govern, we're seeing the same thing. It's better to train a single model for all the items we might want to pick and place in a warehouse rather than warehouse specific models for the specific items in those warehouses. Somehow the one bigger model understands in some sense items in warehouses better, even when applying it later to a specific warehouse. Yeah, super interesting. Um, for us, it was both like a um, question of accuracy. So we, we were able to achieve better accuracy. It was also a question of usability. And the ability to have one single model that kind of works seamlessly on many different type of fields is of pretty good value for us because that's kind of one last step for humans to make mistakes. Uh, because before that, like we relied on some human operator to pick the model, essentially to tell us which type of um, plant this field is. That will be right 95, 98% of the time, but you still like two, two to 5% of the time, like you have mistakes, like human errors that are misleading the model by telling him, oh, you own a tomato field, uh, but you're actually on a celery field. And that will mess up the entire system. So by moving to a more general model, we can also kind of remove one more step, one more step from uh, from the the user uh, experience. When I think about uh, deploying AI robotic systems out in the fields, I mean these fields, the lighting conditions can change dramatically, which seems like it would affect what the camera sees, how well computer vision will be able to to do. Um, there is so much, I mean, dirt is maybe not the right word because dirt makes it sound like a, like a bad thing, but there's so much physical stuff that could get into the way of both the robots functioning and the cameras functioning. How do you deal with all of that? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. And obviously we've, we've, we've put, and we still put a lot of effort into making sure that this works well. Uh, and it's not easy. So the first thing you mentioned, you're totally right, like lighting conditions. Like there is no two similar uh, days on, on the field. Like you have clouds, shadows, 
all of these different things. Um, we had different solutions over the years. Like initially, we started by having shades. So we will kind of cover the system with shades, make sure to remove as much um, light coming in as possible, and then have very basic lights inside the shades to sort of have a consistent um, lighting across that small portion of the field that the camera was looking at. We used that for, for a while. It kind of worked well. The downside of, of it is that it's it's heavy. Uh, you need to, to add hardware that and hardware can break. Like it, it does come at a at a at a pretty significant cost in terms of operations and and, and capex, like hardware cost. More recently, with the last generation of our product, we switched away from it from from this solution, and now we use. Um, custom lights that are extremely powerful and that we designed specifically to get a um, consistent homogeneous lighting across that small part of the field that we're looking at and to essentially beat the sun at its own game uh, by being able to over, we essentially overlight shadows so they essentially disappear. It's pretty impressive. Uh, and even with under the worst conditions, when you have like a super bright sun and with someone standing that kind of casts a, a very clear shadow, all lights are able to um, compensate for that. And you get an image that where essentially you can't even notice the, the, the shadow. So that's our new solution now. And that provides us or provides the computer or the camera with, with very homogeneous um, images which obviously makes it way simpler for models to learn from. Uh, can we remove one degree of freedom? Or we remove one dimension of variability from the data set by controlling the, the light uh, very precisely. Just overpowering how much light the sun would provide. Exactly. And do you need to do anything with the cameras to make sure they're not overexposed? Um, obviously, yes. Like we, we, I mean, they, they, they work together, the lights and the cameras. So we put a, a great deal of effort into picking uh, the sensors, tuning the, the parameters of the camera so that we, we're not over, over, overexposed. Another constraint that we have is that all systems are taking pictures at a pretty high speed. So we need to handle, like we need to have a very um, uh, small exposure time and things like this. So we have um, a good part of the team that's dedicated to making sure that all of these hardware systems uh, work really well together. And they're not kind of off-the-shelf um, systems that we can buy. Like we need to handpick a lot of the components to be able to build these um, systems that are going to be very reliable in terms of accuracy, in terms of overall um, robustness. Because obviously, on top of everything that we mentioned, all of that needs to handle water, dust, wind, um, uh, and and a lot of like a lot of um, perturbations. That, 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 that happened to them. So we need these systems to also be very robust. When you're cutting essentially the root into the root of a weed, um, is that a robot arm that extends to get there? How does that work? And how does it interact with the fact that this field might be a little bumpy and the tractor might, the whole thing might be shaking quite a bit, yet you need to be very precise to not cut into the plants. We use like we call them robotic arm, they're not your typical um, 15 degrees of freedom type of uh, robotic arm. They essentially have three degrees of freedom. They can, um, each blade can essentially move left and right. Um, they can kind of rotate uh, with, a, with an axis that's kind of um, coming from like a top-down axis, around top-down axis. And then um, they can, the entire thing can uh, move up and down to follow the bumps of the field. So these three degrees of freedom are essentially enough for the precision that we need, because we want the blades to follow kind of a path, which is um, almost in a 2D plane, but not exactly, because the 2D plane is actually like this. So it's kind of a 2D plane that um, with hills and, and valleys. So we need three degrees of freedom to, to achieve that. But we don't need like very sophisticated, expensive robotic arms. Uh, and actually, we could not do with these types of things because we need um, our robotic arms to move very quickly. Um, 
to give you a sense, like they're typically about like between 30 and 50 milliseconds between two actions, two independent actions of the same robotic arm. So we need these arms to move not only very precisely, but also very quickly. Um, so limiting the number of degrees of freedom is a key to, uh, uh, to, to achieving this. We've talked a lot about uh, the technical side of what you're doing. Uh, can you say something about the business side? Are you open for business or is this just prototypes? Is there places where if we visited a farm, if we could get access, we could see your system in action? Yeah, we're we're definitely open for for business. Uh, we take we take orders. Uh, if you're interested, so you can go on the website, schedule a demo. Um, we currently have kind of two ways that farmers can access our technology. The first one and the historical one, the one we've been deploying for a couple of years now, is a service model. So the first way farmers can access our technology is by paying us on a per acre basis, um, and with that service, like we our own operators wearing farmers' hats, come on your uh, field and use all technology to perform the task. Um, farmers have been using this for, for three years now. They pay us on a per acre basis for really the work that we do. Now, more recently, like we've, with the, the maturity of the product reaching new, new, new levels, we started to sell. And so we're now also open to sell our next generation or our new generation of, of machine to farmers directly. So they can use with their own operators um, this, technology that, this technology themselves. There are mostly a lot of advantages for them to purchase the equipment because they're like, they have, they have more, more flexibility. It's also better at e economics. But we need to achieve the level of product maturity that we have today to be able to start doing this. So this is what we do now. Um, we work with farmers in mostly in California and Arizona in the US, so west coast of the US, west and south coast of the US. Um, and we're looking at obviously Europe for expansion in the next couple of months. Very exciting. Uh, it's, at least in my experience, it's never easy to truly get things working in the real world. And you're doing that now for three years and counting. Uh, congratulations. It's, it's amazing. Thanks. It's a big team effort. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure it is. <laughs> Now, when you look ahead, um, right now you are doing chemical-free weeding effectively, right? Um, and that in itself, I imagine, can be a very large business. But as the technology is maturing, I imagine you're, you've been thinking about next steps. What are the next technologies you want to develop and then bring to market? both yourself and maybe I'm also curious, maybe things you, you wouldn't take on, but that you think are on the horizon that we could see happen, but maybe, you know, you'll let other companies take on. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there are a couple of very exciting uh, new projects that are happening at FarmWise right now. Like some of them I can't talk about, but some of them I can. Um, one of the kind of key um, directions that we're taking is finding ways to make all technology available to a broader set of um, farm, farming machines. So we've developed, as I mentioned, a huge um, software stack from capturing images to, to training to deploying models. I also talked about the, all of the efforts that we put into the cameras and the, the data capture systems that we have today. Uh, and obviously there's the entire kind of robotics side of things. We're actively working on finding or, or, or like designing products to adapt the first two, adapt the, the, the software stack and adapt the um, data capture capabilities to other farming machines. And so we're talking with OEMs, like ag manufacturers, and um, we have active discussions with them to, to work together to essentially make most farming machines uh, smart. And that's kind of our dream. That's uh, been my co-founder and I uh, dreams for for seven years now, seeing every farming machines in the world um, equipped with cameras and computer vision algorithms to be able to um, be drastically more precise because we're doing it on reading today, but the very same principles apply for fertilizing, for, for fungicide application, for um, insecticide application, and even for like to, to some extent harvesting and, and, and other tasks. So we're super excited to, now that we have a product that's working for one task, 
to be able to expand this to, to other tasks as well. And then there is another dimension of expansion for, for this type of technology, which is working on different type of crop. Um, I talked a lot about broccoli, for instance. We work today on vegetables, um, mostly vegetables. And we have more than a dozen crops that the same machine can work on. We're actively looking at um, ad adapting the technology to be able to work on different segments of the uh, farming industry, namely the big acres farm, the corn, the soybean, things like this. You can think about fruits and trees as well. So each of these different segments come with different specificities that you need to account for. Uh, but we're very excited to essentially take the same principles the, and some of the same technology and adapt it to these different tasks and to these different crop types. So that's in a nutshell kind of what's next for us. Um, and that's obviously a pretty exciting thing for, for, for me and for, for us. Uh, with the goal being the same always, which is how we cut on the um, inputs, the, the chemical inputs, the fertilizer, how we drastically cut that while achieving same or better outcome in terms of yields and, and quality of, of food produced. Are there other things that are on your, on your mind that you don't see within the scope for, for farm-wise, but that you think are also going to really affect how farming is done? In terms of like the broader technology landscape, um, I think there's like super exciting things uh, happening on the um, like bio biology side, both the genetics and the um, bacteria uh, work. Like we're just starting to scrap the surface of understanding what makes a good soil and how to use bacteria and, and, and the, the soil biome to optimize yield. Uh, that's kind of an all new type of technology that I'm pretty excited about. Has nothing to do or very little to do with AI and, and robotics, but I think it's very exciting to, um, so the combination of good genetics with good understanding of um, the, the bacteria ecosystem in the soil, I think is a very exciting, uh, exciting field. It reminds me of other things that are uh, studied a lot these days. Um, in fact, in, in just uh, a couple episodes ago, I talked with uh, Yaniv Altschuler from um, Meta, and they're optimizing the, essentially the digestion of cows um, with effectively you know, pro probiotic supplements, which is not in the soil, but the soil is in some sense the digestion system for the plants where that lives. And this is the, for the cows, very, very, very similar in many ways. Bacteria, the right bacteria, yeah. somehow optimizing things in a way that you know, is just so much better than otherwise. That's, that's very cool. That's very cool. Actually, um, in terms of productivity, I also know that like from the 1900 to 2020, um, milk production per cow has, I think, 5x. Um, oh, wow. so it's not, it doesn't only, like these productivity gains don't only apply to acres. They will also apply to different segments of the food production industry, including milk. Um, so, I'm not surprised that there is still a lot of in in innovation to be done uh, in, in that segment as well. So I'm curious, where did you grow up and how did you end up so interested in the combination of AI and farming? Yeah, so I, I grew up in the uh, suburbs of Paris uh, for most of my life. Uh, went to undergrads in same like uh, different suburbs, but still around Paris. I then moved to the U.S. for, for grad school, uh, spent two years at MIT studying computer science. And that's when I first got uh, introduced to AI technologies and, and machine learning, deep learning technologies that obviously I found fascinating. So I spent my two years st studying these technologies and playing around with them. So that essentially when I really f um, fell in love with the technology side of, um, of things, and then when I graduated, so that was like summer 2016, I graduated from MIT and I had this very good friend that was actually graduating from, from Stanford. And we, we had uh, gone to an undergrad together and we decided to explore like how could we apply this very new, cool uh, and what seems to be very powerful technology to do something good in the world. Uh, that's kind of a very... Um, uh, cheesy maybe, but, but, but true. And we explored a few different um, in 
uh, industries, and we got quickly fascinated by by farming for a couple of reasons. Like the first one being, it's it's a massive industry; it touches everyone, uh, and it's obviously worldwide and has a massive impact on the environment. We talked about this at the beginning. Um, so the impact of that industry is is massive. It's not only economically massive, but it's uh, massive in terms of negative impact, but also opportunities to make that impact better. So that's the first, that was the first reason. And then when we started to um, talk to farmers, the, like we, we talked to um, almost 100 farmers, probably like we, we will go to, to farmers markets and kind of ask them to, if we could visit their farm and then accompany them to their farm to, to kind of uh, spend, um, spend time with them. We discovered that they had a lot of problems but that no company was really kind of even looking at leveraging AI and robotics um, to provide some new solutions to them. You had on one hand, the big ag companies, the, the John Deere uh, and Monsanto of the world, they were not talking much about AI data uh, or robotics at the time, uh, almost nothing. And then on, on the other side, you had the obvious tech companies, um, Facebook, Google, like all of these large tech companies. And quickly we realized there is no way on earth they're going to uh, ever sell directly to farmers. Like farming is very specific industry, it's very hard to sell into. Um, so that's what got us very interested. Like we, we figured that there was probably big opportunities there because, because of that, of that discrepancy between the size of the problems and the number of people actually trying to address them. And so from there, you just incorporated and, and got going? Pretty much. Uh, we incorporated, uh, we kind of, I, so I was living in Cambridge, in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. I moved to, to San Francisco and then we started the, um, I guess, pretty classic startup, um, st startup game. We raised from angels, we went through an incubator, we did very weird looking prototype that didn't work, but attracted a little bit of a customer validation that we used to raise money. And then kind of, we, we went around that circle um, a couple of times uh, to, to raise more and more money and, and hire a bigger engineering team to, to finally kind of build a product that, that made sense for, for farmers. Well, congratulations on, on this journey and, and, and very happy with <laughs> personally with what you're doing, because I think, you know, Healthier food is going to help so many, so many people, the better climate situation, and so many good things are coming out of what you're doing. Now, of course, you keep very busy, um, but do you ever have time to relax? And if so, what do you do? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I sometimes have time uh, and it really depends. Uh, I did not have time for many years, but um, yeah, I, so a couple of things, I, I mean, I, love reading. Uh, I mentioned one book, I think it's, I highly recommend that book, The Alchemy of Air. Uh, but I, I love reading. I spend quite a bit of time reading. Um, I love meeting interesting people uh, that are doing uh, interesting things, either in academia or, um, or businesses in a wide variety of, um, of domains. Like I, I studied physics and math, in, 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 math in, in undergrad, so I have a sweet spot for, for everything that's like highly scientific. Um, so I really enjoy like meeting people they are doing interesting things uh, like this. I maybe like, yeah, I play chess a little bit. I started to play chess a, little, um, a few years ago. And then I, uh, I try to play squash once a week uh, when, uh, when, when I have time. Also getting some, some physical exercise in. Trying to, trying to. It's great. Well, Seb, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I learned so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure, Peter.